Today we're talking to John as he is the author of a recently published book. Here it is, The Uncomfortable Truth About Racism, a book that tackles prejudice head on with interesting points of view on unconscious bias and social hierarchies. John, let's get straight into it. If the if you're writing the book today, you would add a chapter on the Ukraine conflict, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. How do you see the situation there from the book's point of view? Well, obviously, from first of all, we have to say that um, I have complete empathy, sympathy, support for Ukraine in terms of what they're actually going through. The bits of the book would not be a, 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 a perception of who is right and who's wrong, because it's obviously Russia are the aggressors. But it's the world's response to what's ha happening when we actually see um, refugees and how much empathy we in the West feel towards certain groups of refugees. Now, if you look at what's happening in Mali, Chad, um, Yemen, uh, the, um, <clears throat> Afghanistan, <clears throat> Iraq, um, over the last 20 years, they have had lots of refugees, but the world hasn't shown them as much empathy. Uh, and we can all say that it's because it's, it's Europe. Um, it's Eastern Europe. Ukraine, Ukrainians haven't got as much anything in common with English people or Americans but more than, than Africans do or Yemenis do. But of course, it's because they look like us. And when I say us, I don't mean me. I mean, it looks like people in the West. So of course, that is why we feel that empathy, which goes to show that we do have an unconscious, not only unconscious bias, but an unconscious hierarchy in terms of our perception of who we consider to be worthy of our empathy. And even if it's understandable, then it is understandable. Because I'm, I suppose, you know, in the West, if, if, if Americans and, well, white Americans, white Europeans see blonde hair, blue-eyed babies being killed, then of course, that may tug on their heartstrings. But what we have to do is we have to admit it and we have to acknowledge it. We can't just say we see everybody as equal because we don't. And this is an example of a, a tangible example of the very fact that we actually don't see everyone as equal because of the, and it's 100% correct, the empathy and the support that you're actually getting. But if we would see what's going on around the world, different groups of people don't get the same support. And un unconscious bias, how do you see that? Uh, we're talking about the UK, we're both British. How do you see that as creating problems uh, in, in our society in the UK? But once again, it's not just unconscious bias, because the book is not just about race. It's a very intersectional book. What is the unconscious bias we have towards women, towards Catholics, if you're a Protestant, towards, I don't know what it's like in America, probably similar to England, where you have the North and the South divide. What do people in the cities feel about the people in the Midwest in terms of the perception we have of them and their worth from an intellectual and moral point of view? And this is the unconscious bias that we all have, because this is the way we have been conditioned to think and conditioned to feel, and, and it's been around for, for hundreds of years, uh, and we're trying to simplify things by just saying that everything we have learned for the last two, three hundred years, forget it, it's rubbish. And we say, why is that? Because we're all the same, we're all equal. That's too simple. We have to deconstruct and, dis and, and dismantle what we have unconsciously learned. And of course, this is an example of unconscious bias, because people aren't consciously thinking, let us support Ukraine more than we support Yemen. It is an unconscious um, feeling that we actually have based on how we, but, but what we have to do is we have to acknowledge it. That's the most important thing, rather than making excuses for it. Right. Now, uh, as you mentioned, so I've, we're both British. I've been in the US, lived in New York for three months. You have familial links to uh, the US. From your point of view, how do you see the uh, black experience being different in the UK compared to the US? Well, the black experience is different all over the world. The black experience in Africa, uh, for the black Africans who weren't sold as slaves, uh, to the black um, Caribbeans, in terms of the Africans who were sold to the Caribbean, as regards the black black people who are sold in America, it's completely different. Because for, for a start, if you look at the Caribbean, I'll mention the Caribbean first. The Caribbean, where the black slaves, and I'm from Jamaica, were then sold. We then became the majority. We had, um, from the 50s, the 60s, until independence, there was a, a, a modicum of, of self-governance under the British flag. But we had that, that relationship. Whereas in America, it's completely different, because there was no self-governance for black people in America, but there was in Jamaica. While there still was discrimination between the black hierarchy, the black elite, and the non-black elite, there, there was still, and there still is a lot of discrimination, as happens in Africa. And of course, in America, they have been, I suppose you would say, um, completely discriminated against from a, 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 I hate talking about what, you know, white supremacy or, or that kind of a situation, but in a, in, in a predominantly white country, they have been discriminated against um, in a much more, in a much harsher way. Now, in England, the majority of, particularly my generation, who came to England came from the Caribbean, 
when it was independent or just before independence in the 50s or the 60s. And of course, the dynamic that we had being here in England for the last 50 years is completely different to the, what black Americans have gone through for the last 300 years. So when we try and lump everything together and we talk about racism and, and, and the experience of black people going through what they go through, um, it, you have to dissect it and look at it in different areas. And of course, I see this as a West, black Western problem. Because, of course, if you look at the horrors in Africa and what happens in Africa, where you will say black people are discriminated against other black people, there are the nuances around class, privilege, elitism, which has to be taken alongside race. But unfortunately, I think we in the West or in England and America feel it's just a racial issue. It's not, because you have a lot of black privileged elite people who are doing quite nicely, thank you very much. So it's a very, it's a very complex and nuanced subject. Yeah, so you mentioned the, the black elite uh, there. I mean, you, you have some very interesting point of, points of view on, on that in terms of what happens when uh, black people are elevated to positions of power, especially in, in the US, where that's becoming more and more common. Uh, we've had Barack Obama. We have, we have black mayors over here. Maybe uh, we're going to have a uh, black Supreme Court judge. Um, your point of view, is, is, that, is that helping uh, the, the average uh, black person's experience? Well, it's not just from a black perspective, it's from a female perspective. You know, you look at Kamala Harris, you look at um, the chief of police here, Cressida Dick, when you have horrendous abuse of women and they feel that because a woman's in charge, things will get better for women. It is the system that we have to challenge. And the system is part of society, part of the way we've been um, conditioned to think. And if you're a part of that system, it's not up to an individual to change anything. Because if that was the case, when Obama, Obama became president, things could have gotten much better for black people. Kamala Harris, in terms of what she did before, and you see the amount of black people in, in prison, she had no control over that. Because as an individual, women, gay person, black person, you have no control over the system. And the system is there designed to protect a particular group of people. And of course, you have to look at it from a capitalist point of view, which is about discrimination and exploitation. So it's a very, very complex situation. And the, the solution for me isn't necessarily to get black people to these positions of power. It's great that the, the black person from an individual perspective can raise out of the discrimination they have undoubtedly been through to show their excellence, to become powerful people. But all we're doing is elevating them out of blackness. We have to change the perception of the average black person, the average woman, the average gay person, rather than elevating those, those groups those individual people out of those groups and saying to ourselves, things are better because Obama is president, Kamala Harris, and, you know, we have a gay prime minister of Ireland, for example. That doesn't change things for gay people generally. And um, if you could go, go into your, obviously, in, in the book mentioned the, your point of view, the difference between racism and racist incidents, obviously, that relates to uh, your points of view on, on the black elite. If you could uh, go into that, please. Well, well, I, I have always felt that I suffered racist incidents because, of course, my father was a colonel in the Jamaican army. When we came, he was a diplomat. So we lived in some of the most affluent areas in London. Um, I'm from a quite elite... Um, um, he was a diplomat, but my mother's family were quite political in Jamaica. So I, and since I was 17 years old, I played football as a professional footballer playing for England. I lived in a nice house. So therefore, I consider myself to be privileged. Um, and when I started to play football, I became more privileged. So what, I, what happened to me... I experienced racist incidents. Bananas came on the field. I would have got racist abuse. So, you know, that's for 90 minutes on a Saturday or on a Wednesday. But for the other six days of the week, I could go to the front of any queue. I could go to the Houses of Parliament and speak to the Prime Minister. I would be allowed into the higher echelons of society because of my privilege of being a footballer or a celebrity. Whereas, so therefore, any, any negative aspect I, I experienced as a black person were incidents. And what I refused to do, as Malcolm X, sorry, as Martin Luther King said, I think it was about 1962, I find it hard to capitalize on negative aspects of blackness while not enduring the everyday black experience. Meaning the everyday black experience is for the average black person who can't get a job, can't get a house, is imprisoned, is, is picked upon every single day of their lives. And that doesn't happen to me or a lot of the black elite. So that is why I'm, I'm using my voice to talk about, OK, things are bad. We need more black people winning Oscars and we need John Barnes, you know, from a footballing perspective to get a job as a manager. But things are much worse for the average black person in the inner cities. And that's who we should be speaking for. Um, yeah, so obviously, we, again, we're both British. Uh, we both know how uh, where the Premier League's come from. Uh, to any Americans watching who watch the glossy Premier League, uh, today, the very well-produced Premier League, um, they, they probably won't understand how bad it was with regards to racism, uh, especially when you were playing, when your uh, predecessors were playing uh, in the 70s and the 60s. I mean, if you could maybe just uh, enlighten our audience just, just how, how bad it was, but also how far we've come. Well, it wasn't 
as bad for me as it was for black non-footballers. As I said, as a black footballer, even back in the bad old days when bananas were coming on the field and were being racially abused, um, while I then got on a nice coach to go home and drinking a nice glass of wine while I'm having my fillet steak and I'm looking out through the window, I saw black fans cowering in corners, hiding around corners and being attacked. And no one speaks for them because they feel sorry for me. So that is why I'm saying even from that point of view, yes, it would have been bad. However, unconscious bias is such an important thing that we really have to address. And I'll tell you why, because that was, and I wouldn't accuse fans of being overtly necessarily racist. Of course, they go along with the crowd and they're unconscious bias, so therefore they come out and they show whatever they, however they want to show that. But being from America or people in America, um, the perception that we had of black footballers and their moral and intellectual worth or their ability back when I played, because there were as many black footballers as there are now, how many white American footballers are there? And I'm sure they have lots of good players, but the perception we have of Americans is that they don't play football. Just like the perception we have of black people is that, well, they can't think too much, they won't put them into positions of power. How do we feel about women? We don't put them in these Fortune 500 companies as directors because women aren't supposed to do that. So it's all to do with the unconscious bias that we have. But I can give you lots of examples about you know the things we went through. But what I went through as a footballer isn't different to, to what so many people so many people went through. Uh, and something that is is happening over here at the moment, obviously that um, the lack of black coaches in the NFL. We'll see that that was a a story with regards to yourself, um, the, the lack of opportunities that. Uh, you had compared to how amazing your on-pitch career was. Um, people thought that you, you should have been given more opportunities. But again, uh, from, from your point of view, um, how do you see that? And especially compared to the, the narrative over here, where it's it's uh, a lot, um, you know, it's seen as a, a racist um, uh, racism as a, a a part of that. Well, first of all, you have to change the perception of of, of somebody's ability. That's what you have to do. Now, of course, the Rooney Rule came in 20-odd years ago for that very reason, the lack of black coaches in, in, in American football. And the Rooney Rule came in because there were three or four black coaches 25 years ago, 20-odd years ago. Here we are 20-odd years later, and there's still only three, if that, black coaches. So has the Rooney Rule worked? You can't pass laws. You have to change people's perceptions because there are always ways around the laws. What you have to do is change your perception of that person's intellectual worth and the morality and his leadership qualities, then you'll see more black coaches. You can't just force people to give a black man a job because what will happen is after a while, there are always gonna be ways around you not giving him a job and not be illegal to do that. So, you know, I understand positive affirmative action, positive discrimination, but we have to move on and then say, let us now start to change perceptions rather than just put laws in place. It's been illegal to murder and kill for a thousand years. Since the civil rights movement, um, in fact, after before the Jim Crow laws, after the American War, um, American Civil War, you had lots of black leaders in America until the Jim Crow laws came in, because all you did was put laws in place without changing the perception of the worth of that person. And too many people are talking about passing laws without changing the perception that people have. Talking about um, the push for equality, uh, again, from the book, uh, I think it's fair to say that you feel Social hierarchies or class uh, have a greater impact on an individual's life than their race. Um, that isn't a mainstream view in, in the U.S. Um, maybe you could uh, talk talk to a, that that point of view and where that comes from. Well, it doesn't it doesn't have a, a big impact on their race if they are capable. If they are capable, but in fact, if they're more than capable, at times their race isn't going to stop them. Like we've seen with Obama, Kamala Harris, and we've seen with the black sportsmen, black business leaders, black multimillionaires. However, for the majority of people, their race does play a, a, a part in that. All you have to, what you have to do is you have to help someone to maximize their potential by giving them that equal opportunity. So it is not always down to race, but there are times when it is, and down to gender, and down to sexuality, and down to religion. So um, a, a group of people who are discriminated against also are white working class people. I can't speak for America, but here in England because white working class people still aren't being given opportunities. And if it was as simple as, if it was as simple as saying white people are superior and white people rule the world and white people are getting everything, why are there so many poor white people who can't get jobs and houses either? So that is why you have to look at the nuances around race, class, capitalism, um, elitism. Um, so it's not, it's not one or the other. It's a combination of everything. Because as I said, you have a lot of black elite people. I mean, not as many as black non-elite people, but there are a lot of black people who are doing well. A lot of women are doing well. When Meryl Streep and Helen Mirren win an Oscar over, at the age of over 80, and they say, this is the victory for women over 80. No, it's not. It's the victory for those two. They're the only two doing it. 
So when we have a black president and we think, oh, it's a victory for black people, no, it's not. It's a victory for Obama because he's brilliant or another brilliant black person. So, you know, we have to really look at it from a very nuanced and intersectional way in terms of bias and perception of different groups of people. So let's, uh, we're going we're gonna to end with going to be talking about your, your points of view on how we can solve these issues. But before we do that, let's, uh, let's talk about what we're not doing correctly from your point of view. So we're going to talk about Liam Neeson, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Winston Churchill, and, and Gandhi. So let, let's do Neeson first. Uh, Sky News headline here. Liam Neeson said he had violent thoughts about killing a black person after the alleged rape of a friend. John, mm. you came on British TV with a passionate defense of Neeson and said he deserves a medal. Uh, why did you do that? And do you still think that now? Well, Liam Neeson didn't say that. What Liam Neeson was asked was whether he had any negative aspects of his life that he regrets. And what he said was, I went through a very dark period in my life when my cousin was raped and I found out that it was a black person. And for one week in my life, I wanted to kill any black person I saw. I got help from the priest. I was disgusted. I was ashamed of the way I felt. That is what I heard. He was disgusted. He was ashamed. He got help from the priest. And then after that, he never had those thoughts at all. People didn't think about that. All people heard was he said he wanted to kill a black person. Now, of course, because of the way he has been conditioned to think, as we all have, we may then think certain things about different groups of people. But if you address it and we internalize it and we know that it's wrong and we try to come out on the other side, we should be commended for that. Whereas after that happened, anyone who had a negative thought towards a black person, not in terms of killing them, but in terms of if you're walking down the street and you feel you're a woman and you feel a black person is coming towards you, may mug you, so you hold your hand back and you cross the road without saying a word, that is also racially biased. But if you were to come out and you were to say that, what happened to Liam Neeson would happen to you. And people are going to go, you're racist and cancel you and want to fire you. So therefore, what do you do? You keep your mouth shut. So you have to have these conversations. And what Liam Neeson actually said in terms of how he felt ashamed and embarrassed is what I took away from that conversation. So from that point of view, but also if you look at how, how racism um, affects us all in terms of our, our perception of racial hierarchy, I'll have to mention Gandhi. Now, Gandhi was a great freedom fighter for equality, great freedom fighter for equality for Indians like him because he knew being a brilliant lawyer that other Indians like him have the potential to do that. So therefore, the way they're actually treating India as second-class citizens is wrong because they have that potential. When he went to South Africa and saw the way that Indians were treated in the same way as South Africans, he felt disgusted that Indians were treated in the same way as the black savages, as he called them. Now, for a freedom fighter for equality, he has been conditioned, because he's brought up in London in the temple, from a legal point of view, to think of black people have been um, unequal. So therefore, if someone as great as Gandhi, who believes in equality for all, but he's been conditioned to think of black inferiority, what chance has anyone else got? So that is why I'm not pointing the finger at the, the pointy-hatted Ku Klux Klan men, neo-Nazi people. We all have to look at ourselves, because Martin Luther King actually then said, it's not the, the, it, is not the, it is the shallow understanding of racial bias by good people, meaning you, me, everybody around, we're all good people. The shallow understanding of racial bias, which is a problem, not the total misunderstanding by bad people. The total misunderstanding are the neo-Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan, the racist football fans, and we think they're the problem. They are not the problem. We are the problem. The ones who don't acknowledge the fact that we see races in, for, in, in terms of hierarchy. And once again, that Ukraine situation really brings it home to us. And two, two men who are definitely revered over here in the U.S., uh, Jefferson and Churchill, um, what, what does their position in the U.S. Say, say to you? Well, Jefferson was obviously a, 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 a man for, for freedom for Americans, but of course he had slaves. And once again, in terms of feeling it's wrong to enslave somebody, is completely right. With Jefferson, a lot of the, the, the um, anti-slavery -slave, campaigners felt that it's wrong to enslave black people, so they fought to free black people. But very few of them, if any, ever thought black people were equal. So as much as we're saying we, we, we don't want to enslave them, but do we consider them to be equal, morally and intellectually? No. Can they ever be? No. But we shouldn't enslave them. And, and we just feel, as long as we don't enslave them, the fact that we don't see them as equal and we think we're superior to them is okay. We have to do it the other way around. I'd much rather say, see me as equal, morally and intellectually, and enslave me. And um, so, we definitely been talking about very interesting uh, points here. In terms of ending on a positive note, from your point of view, how do we uh, solve the issues that, we're, uh, that we've spoken about? How do we drive change for the better, from your point of view? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to acknowledge that it exists. And, it, and not just acknowledge that it exists in the overtly racist people, the Russians and, and you know, the Ku Klux Klan, 
and the National Front here and the people who voted Brexit. We have to look at ourselves and say, do we truly believe in equality? Now, what will then happen is when we get rid of racism, sexism, homophobia, and any other kind of bias, the vast majority of black people, women, gay people will be exactly where they are. But they won't be there because they're black, because they're gay, because they're female. They'll be there because every human being has it within himself, the ability, the capabilities in terms of what we consider to be modern intellect, to wake up, to try hard, to, to try harder than somebody else, to be more intelligent, to be willing to work. But at this moment in time, there are also other negative factors that play on someone's ability to maximize their potential, and that has to do with race, gender, and sexuality as well. So it's not going to be a Wakanda for black people when we get rid of racism. Everybody's going to be great. Um, we'll just be like white people. And there are lots of disenfranchised white people, but they're not disenfranchised because they're white. Plenty of us to think about here at the Bloomberg Equality Summit. John Barnes, thank you for a great discussion.